Hey, good morning, friends and church family, and hopefully some new faces this morning uh, tuning in to, to listen to this message. Welcome to online uh, church. This online um, platform has been a blessing, and we're grateful that you're here with us this morning. Before we jump into our series through the Gospel of John, I want to just remind you about the opportunity to, to give. Um, it's a form of worship, and we're grateful that we all get to be generous. You know, three different ways. Uh, first of all, you can mail your check, your tithe check, uh, to City Soul Ministries, 1101 46th Street, uh, here in Vienna, West Virginia, zip code 26105. You can also text any amount, which is obviously a very easy way, uh, to the number 84321. Or you can go to our website and securely uh, give at citysoulministries.org. Uh, I will also tell you our website's a great resource. Uh, there's our bulletin on there. There's our beliefs on there. Uh, just a great resource for you to maybe, if you're you know, prayerfully looking for a church, uh, to uh, read about City Soul. And if you have any questions or would just like to connect with us, you can fill out a connect card on there as well. So today we're going to pick up today in our series to the Gospel of John. We've been going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and today we are uh, in chapter 16, and we're going to be tackling verses 16 through 24. So what Jesus has been telling his disciples is basically, hey guys, following me is not going to be easy. Um, in fact, it's going to be really difficult. The world is going to hate you because you are my followers. Well, today Jesus is going to follow up that uh, difficult news, you know, uh, landing upon the ears and the hearts of the disciples with a section that's entitled, Their Sorrow Will Be Turned Into Joy. Before we get into our text today, I just want to remind you that as Christians, I'm going to remind you of this now and I'm going to close the message with reminding you of this, that our lives as Christians is to be filled with joy. Despite our circumstances, despite what's happening, despite what's going on around us, Life will be hard at times, but the definition of our lives is our joy and our hope in Jesus Christ. So today we're going to pick up in verse 16, and I'm going to read down to verse 20. So let's read those together. He says, a little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do know that he is, we do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. So there's actually a lot happening here in just these, these four verses, and that's almost like a, a tongue twister to, to, try, to try and read. What does this statement mean in a little while? Well, the statement a little while can actually mean a lot of different things. I mean, think about different circumstances in your life if you're doing something. You know, I'm going to go do this for a little while. I'm going to go do that for a little while. Kind of depends on what you're doing based on how we would interpret that time frame. Well, the question we, we want to come back to here is where is Jesus about to go? Well, scholars have actually debated the exact meaning of Jesus' words here. And they're, they're kind of divided upon what exactly the conclusion is of what he's talking about here. Well, the reality is, is looking at the text and the timeline here, it's Thursday night, the night before Jesus is to die to go to the cross. So this time frame given here in a little while, they will see him no more in light of that. That Jesus is talking about the fact that he was about to be arrested, crucified, and buried. And the disciples would be scattered from him. They would be absent from him for a short while. They wouldn't see him at all. But of course, on the third day, he would conquer the grave by resurrection and, and appear to many of them. So that could be a little while. And most likely, that's what he, Jesus is talking about here. The amazing joy that would fill their hearts when they would see the resurrected Christ. And of course, the comfort and the joy that they would receive when the Holy Spirit would come at, at Pentecost. The other, the other meaning here that scholars take on this uh, makes complete sense as well in the fact that Jesus was referring to his ascension back to heaven. 
that he is going back to the Father, that the Holy Spirit is going to be sent at Pentecost, therefore showing that he and the the Spirit are one. Christ now dwells in the life of each believer through the Holy Spirit. In that regard, that's how they would see him in just a short time or just a, a little while. So technically, you and I are living in that time now. All believers empowered by the Holy Spirit. We are looking forward to the time of Christ's second advent, his second coming, his return to take his church. As J.C. Ryle uh, uh, read his commentary over the Gospel of John, this, this is what he says over these verses. He says, That same Jesus who was taken up visibly into heaven shall also come visibly again, even as he went. Let the eyes of our faith always be fixed upon that coming. It's not enough that we look backward to the cross and rejoice in Christ dying for our sins and upward to the right hand of God and rejoice in Christ interceding for every believer. We must do more than this. We must look forward to Christ's return from heaven to bless his people and to wind up the work of redemption. Whatever whatever it is, whatever exactly Jesus was speaking of here when he's talking about in a little while, because either way is right and totally biblical because struggle is a part of either scenario these disciples were confused and they were about to experience an incredible amount of joy i would say to you that jesus is speaking of the events that are about to unfold here in just the short hours to come as he was about to be arrested and go to the cross you know this this horrible death that jesus was about to die would seem so hard so difficult But an unspeakable joy was to come from his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Jesus is saying the world is going to be happy that I am about to die. The world is going to rejoice when my blood is shed upon that cross. All evil, Satan is going to rejoice. The religious leaders who have rejected me, they're going to rejoice when they see me upon the cross because they think that they've won. The world is going to be happy when I die upon the cross. But he tells the disciples, guys, for you, during that time, for a little while, you're going to be devastated. You're going to be crying. You're going to be so upset. But it's just for a little while. These men would soon begin to wrap their minds around the fact that the work of the cross and what Christ accomplished on the cross, the coming of the Holy Spirit would bring them this joy And apply that truth to their lives. Well, the same is true for you and I today as well. Our joy, our faith is in Jesus Christ. You know, as as a pastor, I I do a a lot of funerals. And as I preach funerals and I share a, a hope with the family at every funeral, is the joy of salvation. That's the only hope that we have standing at the casket of our loved ones. These disciples knew what it was like to experience sorrow. And many of them would go on to lose their lives for the preaching of the gospel. He brought them through that. And today we look forward to the promise of heaven. This phrase, a little while, can seem like a long time depending upon what your circumstances may be. For example... If I'm sitting on the beach and it's a 75 degree day and the sun's beating down, it's beautiful and there's a light breeze and I'm sitting there watching my kids play in the ocean, I mean, 20 minutes, you know, a little while then may may feel, you know, just like a little while, you know, but if I'm, my kids are hungry and I'm like, dad, we want something to eat. And I pull into the McDonald's drive through and there's 50 cars and I have to sit in the line waiting for 20 minutes. I mean, that seems like forever. Well, then Jesus paints this incredible picture. He gives us this amazing illustration in verses 21 through 22. Jesus paints this picture that every mother that's listening to this message today is going to understand completely. And he talks about the analogy of the pain of childbirth and the the pain and the anguish and the struggle that a mother goes through, but the unspeakable joy that is the result of that pain. Let's read what Jesus says in verses 21 and 22 to his disciples. He says, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, 
she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been brought into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will ever take your joy from you. You know, after being in, in the room, in the delivery room myself, and experiencing the miracle of childbirth, first of all, I don't know how someone could deny the existence of God. Seeing the miracle of a child brought into this world, it, it changes you. And I've seen that hour that Jesus speaks here uh, come from, from my wife on two different occasions because we have two children. To see my, my quiet and reserved Um, very timid wife lay there on that hospital bed and scream and sweat and roll around in utter agony and me standing there hope you know not hopeless but but helpless you know in, in total shock may I add I mean it's it's a scary time I mean I'm 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 standing there just you know uh uh worried sweating like crazy and you know she's obviously doing the same and the nurses come in and they say well it's time. It's time for the baby to come. I mean, that's, a, that's a, a scary, uncertain time. You can't help but think to yourself, after the baby is, is here and everything settles down, you can't help but think to yourself, as, as a man, I'm speaking from a, a father's perspective, to see your wife go through that, I, can't, I think to myself, I can't imagine my wife ever going through this again. You know, I can't imagine seeing her go through this anguish again. And for you women, I'm going to tread very carefully here, very cautiously. I bet that in your mind, maybe while you're going through the pain of childbirth and you're rolling around in anguish and the labor pains and the contractions and all the pain, I I bet you probably thought in your mind or maybe even shouted it out at some point during labor, I can't ever do this again. But oh, the joy, oh, the happiness Oh, the love that comes after all the pain. The joy of your child being in your arms. The joy of that young, that, that, that brand new baby nursing its, its mother. The joy of being a parent. The joy that comes after the sorrow and the pain. And then some time goes by, a year or so, and it's almost like you women have amnesia. And you and your spouse are back to doing what it takes for a baby. And before you know it, you're pregnant again. And you're about to go through all of this pain, all of this anguish, all of this quote-unquote struggle or sorrow all over again. And Jesus gives us this beautiful illustration here that all women and even fathers, as you've been in the room, you see that, that pain, but you also see the joy of the child being born. These disciples were about to go through much agony, much pain, and they would all scatter in fear in just a few short hours as Jesus was arrested. They would see Jesus resurrected. They would be filled with so much joy. We all go through pain and hard times. We all go through struggles. We all go through the death of loved ones, and we will all face physical death as well. But our hope this morning, through the struggle, through the pain, through the anguish, is the promise of eternal life. When that time comes or on that day, Jesus says this in verses 23 through 24. Let's read them together. He says, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Remember again, this is the farewell discourse. These are the the final instances recorded in the Gospel of John of the final words of Jesus to his disciples. The disciples will in a little while see the resurrected Christ. The disciples in a little while will experience the joy of the Holy Spirit. When they see the resurrected Christ and they've felt broken and they've felt defeated and the world is laughing and the world is rejoicing and they are lamenting and they are crying and they are grieving, they're totally lost. But when they see the resurrected Christ, when they receive the Holy Spirit, 
It will all make sense. He has conquered the grave. He has overcome death. When the Holy Spirit came to them and the joy of all that truth was revealed to them and opened in their their hearts, all the things that Jesus had said to him, they were now starting to understand. And they were understanding it more fully because the Holy Spirit was now with them. This is the third time that Jesus speaks of praying in his name. We, we've talked about the fact over the other times that Jesus mentions this, that just saying a prayer and tacking on in Jesus' name at the end does not guarantee us that we're going to get whatever we want. This isn't like stumbling upon the magic formula in, in the Bible where you know Jesus is your personal genie and if you tack on his name at the end in Jesus' name and, and then say whatever you want, that you're going to get it. That's not what Jesus is saying. These disciples, they can now, you and I can now directly go to God in the name of Jesus and ask. Ask that God's will is done. God's will is available to us as we pray in Jesus' name. And we pray that God's will would be done. Up until this point, you got to understand that Jesus was obviously with the disciples physically. He was walking with them. He, he was talking with them. He was teaching with them. He was sleeping right beside them. So, so as the disciples, put yourself in their shoes. I mean, they, they were with him. If they ever had a question, can you imagine the conversations they had laying down at night? Like, hey, Jesus, could, could you tell me about this? You know, Jesus, you know, what, what did it mean? What did you mean when you, when you said, you know, these things? They could ask him and he was right there with them to answer. They could ask him face to face. But in the days to come, he was going back to the Father. Now Jesus was saying, now you pray in my name. These disciples had never prayed to the Father in Jesus' name. Of course, we have. You know, we have all the events that have unfolded that the disciples didn't know were going to unfold yet. After Jesus' ascension back to heaven, the disciples would then ask the Father in Jesus' name. And today, as we round out this message, you and I are to pray that way as well, to the Father in Jesus' name. So today, as we come to a close, a simple reminder that we as Christians have this unspeakable joy that nothing in this world can take from us. Nothing can take us, take from us the joy of our salvation. And in the middle of persecution, in the middle of tragedy, in the middle of struggle, in the middle of difficulty, the one thing that never changes is our hope and our joy and our salvation in Jesus Christ. For those of you listening today who are in Christ, in life and in death, the security of our salvation is in Jesus Christ. I just simply ask you today, have you experienced that joy? If you haven't, it's available to you this morning by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, asking him to forgive your sins, to repent of your sins and, and ask him to lead your life. You and I as Christians are to be known for our joy. Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in Christ, despite what our circumstances may be. Is your joy in the Lord today? Let's pray. Lord, today I, I thank you for the joy that you've given me through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, you never promised that our lives on this earth would be easy. There will be days of struggle. There will be days of affliction. There will be days of tragedy. But Father, our hope is in you. Our hope is in the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ. And no matter what this life may bring us, nothing can take that away from us. Father, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for the finished work of Jesus. We thank you for the promise of heaven. And Father, our hope and our joy is in that finished work of Jesus today. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And I pray that, Father, it's gone out to ears that needed to hear it and hearts that are being changed by you. We love you and we praise you and we give you all the glory. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen.